Good afternoon, brethren. I hope you're having a good Sabbath so far. Special thanks, even though they're not here, a special thanks to uh, Stephanie and um, Travis for uh, coming so that Stephanie can sing and then we can propagandize uh, her children's minds with the puppet show. Because that's what it's always about, propagandizing the little kids' minds. Uh, big thank you to the guys who have done so much work out there. Did you all see the accomplishments that they got done today? Doesn't it look great? Really appreciate all the work that uh, they do on the building. And a special thank you to uh, Becky for the idea for the uh, puppet show. So if you didn't like the concept, you, you can blame Becky. She said, I think you could do one on that so the kids will learn to grow up and be nice to each other and all that. Seriously, um, if, if anybody ever has an idea for a puppet show, come see me and you know let me know and I don't expect you to write the script but just give me a concept and we'll see what, you know if we can do something we can't guarantee that we will and you get no royalties you know don't ask for a percentage of the action because there is no action <laughs> so anyway we appreciate uh, Becky's uh, idea and any ideas that you uh, might have on stuff stuff like this um, this afternoon I thought we'd start by taking a, a special trip we're gonna go back about 70 years the time is 1941. The place is the Java Islands in the South Sea Pacific, and the name is Kenningswald. Good German name. In 1941, a German scientist by the name of G.H.R. von Kenningswald goes on an archaeological expedition. Kenningswald is not one who believes in the Bible, he believes in evolution. And on his expedition to Java, he's looking for more proof quote-unquote proof, to demonstrate that the theory of evolution is correct. And on the island of Java in 1941, Kenningswald discovers an old, old jaw, and it's got a bunch of teeth still in it. It's a big jaw. I mean, it's really big. At first, he thinks it belongs to a huge ape, but then he has to admit later on that it's not the jawbone of any animal. It's a human jaw. It's the jaw of a man who lived thousands of years ago. And the scientific world still talks about this jaw and refers to it as the old man of Java. When von Kenningswald finds this jaw, he's perplexed. He doesn't grasp its significance. So he sends it to a friend of his, and his friend is in New York. Another guy, his name is Wiedenreich. Another good German name. Wiedenreich also believes in the theory of evolution, and at the time Wiedenreich is in the process of assembling other interesting archaeological specimens that don't fit into the timeline of evolution. And one of the other specimens that Wiedenreich has is a set of giant human teeth that someone found in China. They're big teeth. Well, first, von Kenningswald is confused, and then Wiedenreich is confused. And again, remember that these guys study and research so that they can help, quote-unquote, prove the theory of evolution. But the specimens that they have in their possession are messing up their belief system because when you take the progression of evolving life, remember it starts with slime and then it, it evolves into a, a plant and then an amoeba and then it evolves to fish, then amphibians, then birds, and then what's next? mammals are next, all that. In this whole process, where do giants fit into this process that they're describing? The problem for evolutionists is, is they don't fit anywhere in the process. So here's what Wiedenreich admits, and I'm going to quote from Wiedenreich, and he says, By comparing the teeth and bones of those of living animals and from careful anatomical measurements, I have decided that the Java giant was much larger than any living gorilla. And the Chinese giant, and we had the teeth from China, the Chinese giant, he said, was one and a half times larger still. That would have made him twice as large as any male gorilla living today. And I'm still quoting from Wiedenreich, and he said, the biblical words of Genesis 6-4 came inevitably to mind. There were giants on the earth at this time. End quote. There were giants at the earth on the earth in those days. What a startling admission for a believer and teacher of evolution to make. He was acknowledging the validity of God's word. And in a sense, he was saying, he's admitting, in this case, I've got to admit that the Bible's right and that evolutionary science is wrong. Why were there giants on the earth in those days? Did angels really marry women? Were giants the offspring of those illicit unions? 
Why does the Bible say that men live longer before the flood than after the flood? What about dinosaurs? Did dinosaurs and men co uh, coexist? And when we read the book of Genesis, these are just some of the many, many questions that come up. So this afternoon, brethren, we're going to try to answer just a few of those questions. Other questions are going to have to wait for another time. Now, our primary goal today is not to study archaeology. That would be boring. Our primary goal is to try to better understand God's law and how keeping it not only affects us individually, but collectively. In short, this afternoon, what I'd like to do, brethren, is answer the question, what happens to a man when he rejects God's law? Before uh, we move on, let's acknowledge some of our sources. I've got some handouts. Could I get someone to, to pass some of these handouts, please? I've got three of them, three different colors. And while they're being handed out, um, I want to acknowledge our sources. Got to give credit to people when I get their information. There's a, a book called The Bible Key to Understanding Early Earth by McLean, Oakland, and McLean. The writings of evolutionary scientists such as Gerald Hawkins and Sir Fred Hoyle. I've got an uh, Associated Press article entitled Man May Have Coexisted with Neanderthals and various articles and booklets from Ambassador. Ambassador College before that organization went into apostasy. Also got some other stuff from BBC News and National Geographic. So I got to give these guys credit. They came up with all this stuff. I didn't. Some time ago, I heard a thought-provoking sermon where a speaker asked a question. He said, "How would your life change if you change if you found out there were no God?" He asked, "If you found out that God didn't exist, what would you do differently?" And I thought about this for several days. I really wanted to ponder this. I discussed it at dinner with family members. And as I was attempting to reason out an answer to this, I started thinking about the subject of the weekly Sabbath. That's the first thing that came to my mind. And I thought to myself, if, if there was no God, would I still keep the weekly Sabbath? But then I got to thinking, I'm, I'm only thinking about this, keeping the Sabbath in terms of a ritual or a rule that only pleases my Creator. And we can't look at the Sabbath that way. We remember that we keep the Sabbath not just because we have a God who demands this of us. We've got to remember that the Creator doesn't tell us to keep the Sabbath because He wants to inflict difficulties on our lives. He instructs us to keep the Sabbath for many reasons. And one of the reasons that we human beings need a day of rest is this. We can't work seven days a week without refreshment. It's not good for our bodies. It's not good for our minds. So I came to the conclusion. I said that even if I somehow came to believe that there was no God, I'd still believe in the Sabbath because I believe it's practical. The Sabbath enhances my mental and physical health. The Sabbath rejuvenates me. It makes me better able to cope with when I've got to function in the world the other six, six days of the week. So I came to the conclusion that even if there were no God, I would still want to keep the Sabbath. Well, then I started thinking about the other commandments. I believed if there, I said, if I believe that if there were no God, I still wouldn't want to commit murder, and I sure don't want others to commit murder, do I? And the same goes with lying, stealing, committing adultery, all these things. And I had to come to the conclusion that even if I believed there was no God, I'd still appreciate the great value of the Ten Commandments. Even with no God, I'd not only keep them, but I'd also encourage others to keep them. And I believe, brethren, that the governments of this world instinctively understand this because we see so much of the Ten Commandments in man's law. Even the atheist has to admit that there's value from refraining from acts such as murdering, stealing, and lying. The criminal laws of, of most of the nation's laws that we have in the world today are based on, not based on, but they include things that we find in the Decalogue and in the Torah. Further, when we read the scriptures, we find that the Ten Commandments were not intro initially introduced to mankind during the time of Moses. And that's a big mistake that a lot of people want to believe when they say the Ten Commandments first were introduced to mankind by Moses. Notice the white handout. It shows that God's laws existed long before Moses was ever born. And these laws were taught by the writers of the New Testament long after Jesus was crucified and resurrected. The Bible is clear that these laws were not just for the ancient Israelites. They were not just for the people of present day Judaism. These laws are for all men for all, kind, all times. Now, let's go back to our giants that have been perplexing evolutionists for so long. What in the world these giants got to do with whether or not a person in the 21st century is going to keep God's law? How do you make the connection? The atheist and agnostic scholars have taught for centuries that man evolved from lower forms of animals. And they say that our first ancestors evolved from apes and then into cavemen and then into us. 
I say, you know, there was this evolutionary cycle. But brethren, we know this is not true. These scholars tell us that when we look at the ancient giants of archaeology, they tell us that these giants were inferior prototypes. They say that there was something incomplete about these people. They say that they, these giants weren't evolved uh, like you and I are. They say that these giants were somehow inferior to modern man. And here's an example. When we hear the term Neanderthal today, doesn't it have a negative connotation? I mean, if I were to call a person a Neanderthal, I'm saying that basically what he is is a knuckle-dragging ignoramus. Isn't that what I'm calling him if I call him a Neanderthal? Yeah, bad connotation. Evolutionists don't want you to believe, uh, or uh, they want you to believe, that present-day man evolved upwardly or ascended from lowly creatures that are stupid, such as the Neanderthal, and that we humans today are superior to those humans who lived thousands of years ago. And actually, brethren, the reverse is true. Contrary to what some scientists would have you believe, the pre-flood giants were not only very powerful, but they were very intelligent and they were very healthy. Now, let's make a distinction. When we read about contemporary giants, the ones that have lived in this age, the ones we see listed in the Guinness Book of World Records, you find that these people have bodies who are not proportional. And probably the most famous giant of all time was the late Andre the Giant. Very famous wrestler. Some of you oh, uh, beat Hulk Hogan, you know. He died several years ago. Andre was almost eight feet tall. He weighed a quarter of a ton, but he was a very unhealthy man, as many uh, giants are that live on the earth today. Now, we're not talking about tall guys. Let's make that distinction, like the guys that play in the NBA. Tall is one thing. Gigantic is another. King Saul, King David's predecessor, was tall. The Bible says that he was head and shoulders above most men, just like the guys in the NBA. But Saul, who was tall, lived side by side with men who were gigantic, the giants. Most giants today have a glandular imbalance. Most have bodies that are not proportional. For example, they have large bones, but then they have regular sized teeth. They usually have poor coordination. They oftentimes suffer from slurred speech. Andre the Giant was only 47 years old when he died from complications due to his body having so many problems from the day that he was born. Giants today are totally different from the giants that we find in the pre-flood world. The Java Giant and the China Giant that we study, read about here, they were from the pre-flood era. And scientists say, they admit, that these guys had no such improportions like the post-flood giants. Archaeologists can find nothing that indicates that these people were in anything other than excellent health. The pre-flood giants were also very intelligent. Now, how do we know that? Well, our brain size is twice that of a male gorilla whose body is much larger than ours. And our brain size is one of the reasons why we're more intelligent than the gorilla. And the brain size of the pre-flood giants was much greater than ours. And although these people had not developed machines and computers, their intelligence capacity was greater than yours or mine. Ruth Moore, in her book, Man, Time, and Fossils, tells us that these people lived side by side with normal people in ancient times. Giants existed before the flood. Noah saw them. Shem saw them. But the giants that are mentioned in Genesis 6 were destroyed in the flood in Genesis 7. When studying these ancient people, we can also learn something that relates to Scripture in another way. You've probably heard of the Cro-Magnon man lived in southern France. Evolutionists will tell you that they were a primitive, non-intelligent group of people. Not so. They were large. Many grew to about seven feet tall. They were not primitive creatures in the evolutionary chain. They had terrific muscular development. They were not freaks. All their body parts were in proportion to each other. Now, the really interesting thing about the Cro-Magnons is that most of the adults had no seams in their skulls. Now, why do we find this so interesting? Whenever a new baby, newborn baby, we're holding him. We have to be real careful because what, do you, what does he got at the top of his head? Got a soft spot, doesn't he? Why does he have a soft spot? Well, the reason is, at his birth, his skull bones have not completely grown together. So we have a soft spot on the top of his head. His, his bones are not yet fused. As he gets older, the skull grows together, and the soft spot is no longer there. It goes away. The bones of our skulls never grow together completely. There is always a seam where the, where the parts of the skull are joined together. We always have a seam up there. 
But suppose you and I didn't die when we hit 80 or 90 or 100 years old. Suppose we didn't die. Suppose we were to live to be several hundred years old. What would happen to the seams in our heads? Well, these seams would be completely eliminated because our skull bones would become completely fused together. In other words, we actually die before our skulls are completely fused. But what do archaeologists find in the Cro-Magnon man? They find that there are no seams in the skulls of the ones who died of old age. This can only mean one thing. They lived several hundred years. Now some skeptics are going to say, well maybe the Cro-Magnons, they were all born this way. Maybe people back then weren't born with a soft spot in the, t in the top of their head. Not so, because they have found that the skulls of those who died young show that they did have soft spots or seams in their heads. The Cro-Magnons were born with soft spots in their heads just like our babies are born with soft spots. But most of them lived so long that their bones fused together in their skulls. And this one piece of scientific information, again, adds validity to God's Word. The Bible tells us that people who lived before the flood lived hundreds of years. And please note from the handout, I think it's the yellow one. It says that Adam lived to be, what, 930? Methuselah lived to be 969 years. That's almost 10 centuries. All these people before the flood lived very lengthy lives. In the Bible, brethren, we see no ascension of the human race where a man starts out as an ape and evolves upward. Instead, we see a human creation by God that miraculously appears in the Garden of Eden and this creation is called, in the Bible, very primitive? No. Is it called very prototype? No. It's called very good. Starting very quickly... This creation begins to degenerate and it's not long before man's lifespan starts to decrease. Another factor we have to acknowledge that contributed to the decreasing of lifespans is that something obviously happened at the time of the flood that caused men to not live as long as they had before the flood. And notice from the yellow handout that most of the people before the flood lived over 900 years. And after the flood, lifespans continue to get shorter. And many Bible scholars believe that this is because the very nature of the earth changed at the flood. Prior to Noah building his ark, um, they say that the world was a totally different place. They say it didn't have polar ice caps. There was no tropical equator. The whole earth was subtropical because it was surrounded by a protective canopy which kept out the sun's UV rays. And what do UV rays cause? They cause aging. All of you know that, that, that put the sunblock before you go out because you don't want your face to turn into leather. Maybe sometime we can do a sermon on uh, the pre-flood world and how the world became very different after the flood. But getting back to our original premise, can you see the difference between what the atheist and agnostic scholars teach and what's in the Bible? The heavy bones that we find in the pre-flood giants, such as the Neanderthals, they are not proof that these guys were primitive. Instead, these, bo these bones are indicators that these guys were like a bunch of Arnold Schwarzeneggers running around only without the benefit of steroids. Okay? They were healthy and they were muscular. But why do we not have these well-developed giants living today? Again, we do have giants in a sense, but our giants today are large because of deformities, not due to physical excellence like these beings who lived before the flood. The uh, atheistic and agnostic scholars say that there's no way to know why these giants died out. Scientists are baffled by their disappearance. So what happened to them? Where did they go? Why are their descendants not with us today? Well, here's some information that may help us guess as to what might happen to them. We start by asking, where do we find the bones of these giants? We find them in Australia, we find them in China, we find them in the South Seas, we find them in the southern tip of Africa. But we do not find these guys in the pre, there are any pre-flood bones in the Holy Land. That is the area around Palestine where so much of God's interaction with man took place. Yes, we do find post-flood bones in the Holy Land, but we don't find pre-flood bones in the Holy Land. All right, now let's talk about this difference between pre-flood and post-flood. Let's look at Strong's Concordance. When we go to the original Hebrew, we find several names for giant. One is Nephilim, the, another is Rephaim. It's on the handout. And what we learn is that before the flood, giants are called Nephilim. After the, of the flood, they are called Rephaim with one exception. We're going to talk about that exception in just a few moments. 
Again, the bones of the giants before the flood are those from a healthy race of people. They are Nephilim. The bones of the giants after the flood are those who were malformed. They are called Rephaim. An example of Rephaim giants would be found in 2 Samuel 21. I'm not going to turn to it, but you can if you want. And here we see how those giants... During the time of David, this is a hint that they weren't healthy. They had deformities. In 2 Samuel 21 20, we read about how David and his followers killed off a whole bunch of giants. And one of these Rephaim had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. Archaeology finds no such deformities in the Nephilim before the flood. But what about the reference to Nephilim in Numbers 13.33? This is the only post-flood use of the word. Let's look at that. Numbers 13 tells how Moses sent 12 spies to check out the promised land. Two of the spies, there were only two, two good guys left out of that bunch, Joshua and Caleb. They came back and they said, let's go up at once and possess the land because we're able to overcome it. We can kick them. Joshua and Caleb says, these people are going to be no match for us because we've got God on our side. But then there were ten spies who gave what verse 30, 32 calls an evil report. Why was this called an evil report? Because they lied when they said the Israelites could not take the land. That was a lie. They lied when the people said when they said the people were so big that the Israelites would be like grasshoppers in comparison. Now, we've had giants on the earth, but none that big that, that humans were like grasshoppers. It's never been that much of a disparity. And they lied when they called them Nephilim. The giants at that time were Rephaim, inferior malformed creatures. People like um, Goliath, who couldn't even carry his own shield. People who were like Andre the Giant. And I believe that the ten spies used the term Nephilim to scare the Israelites into not going forward and doing the work of God. Now, how big were the giants of ancient times? I believe that we can know for sure that the largest giant in human history was at least 12 or 13 feet tall. Maybe some giants were, were taller or larger than 12, 13 feet. I don't think we can prove that at that time. Some Bible scholars think we can. Um, and let's look at what they say. Notice I've got this slide here. And I hope you can see it. Note that skeleton A over there represents a person about six foot tall. This is a common height for men today. Skeleton D, you see that there, represents Goliath, who was nine feet tall, about nine feet tall. We're pretty certain about his height based on what we get out of the Bible. Skeleton E represents King Og, that's spoken of in Deuteronomy 3.11, whose iron bedstead was about 14 feet long and about six feet wide. King Og, we think, was about 12 to 13 feet. We, we feel pretty comfortable with these numbers. And I'm comfortable saying that, you know, the largest man that ever walked the earth was about 12, 13 feet tall in antiquity. But I'm not comfortable with the claims that they have here on the existence of skeletons B, F, G, H, and I that, that are on the slide. And here's what the Bible researchers claim. They say that B represents a skeleton that was found in southeastern Turkey in the late 1950s. But you can't find any confirmation that this is true. I can't, at least I can't. And I'm not saying that this skeleton was not found. I'm just saying that I'm not going to believe it, and believe it until I find some really reputable proof. F, they say, represents a 19-foot, 6-inch skeleton that was found in 1577 in Lucerne, France. Again, I can't find anything to back this up. G represents a 23-foot tall skeleton that was found in 1456 in Valence, France. H represents a 25-foot skeleton that was found in 1613 near Chamont, France. And I, supposedly, represents two 36-foot skeletons found by the Carthaginians between 200 and 600 BC. Again, I don't want to even try to vouch for these really big ones in any research I've done. And I think that when we make claims like this, we need to err on the side of caution and, and not go out on the limb and say, you know, that there are 36-foot skeletons out there that prove that there are big giants like that. So that, And that's one of the reasons I didn't give you this on a handout. I'd hate for this thing to get out and, you know, people go around saying, oh, the Wes White gave this out in a handout, and he's saying there are 36-foot skeletons out there, because I can't believe that right now. If you want to research this further, there's a place called the Mount Blanco Mount Blanc Fossil Museum. 
a lot of information about this. Um, you can go to that museum. You can get stuff online from them. And uh, then they'll link you to other Bible scholars who um, have looked into this subject. Again, let's go back to the question. What happened to these biblical giants? Well, again, the Rephaim are still with us. People like the great Andre the, uh, Andre the Giant. But what about the Nephilim, the pre-flood giants? Most Bible scholars agree that we can't find the Nephilim in the Holy Land. In the Middle East, we find Rephaim bones in the Holy Land. Mostly, we find no, we, uh, small bones, people like you and me. Bible scholars point out that these lighter bone people were probably descended from Seth. And they point out that Noah was descended from Seth. But what about this guy Cain? Cain's a real interesting guy. He's kind of like Nimrod. You, you don't have a lot of information, but based on what you read in the Scripture, this Cain is a real interesting character. We read not only about Cain's descendants, but we also can read in Scripture about Cain's accomplishment, his descendants' accomplish, accomplishments in Genesis. And we also find that Cain had a curse put on him, where his curse was that he had to become a vagabond. And let's make sure that we understand that the curse of Cain was not that he became a Jew. Okay? Because there's some people who want you to believe that's his curse, he became a Jew, which is interesting because Jews are descended from Judah and Judah hadn't even been born yet. Cain was not a black, his curse was not that he was a black man or some other satanic racist teaching that's out there, something like the serpent seed, which is just another big lie. Many scholars from, uh, who believe in the Bible feel that the Nephilim were descended from Cain and that they and Cain were not allowed to live in the Holy Land. That was their, that was their curse. They were banned from, from the Holy Land. And we know that the achievements of Cain and his people continue today. We read about this in Genesis. But Cain's descendants do not live today. They all died in the flood, and this includes the race of giants that we call the Nephilim. So where did the pre-flood giants come from? Well, a lot of Bible scholars believe that we find our answer in Genesis 6-2, uh, where it says that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and took uh, them wives of all which they chose. And a lot of scholars say that the sons of God spoken of here in this particular passage were fallen angels, and that when these angels cohabitated with human women, their offspring was an evil race of giants. If you read the Moffat translation, it actually uses the word angels in verse 2 instead of sons of God. Josephus believed that they were angels. And I understand that this, this uh, belief has come into the church of God. I personally don't agree with it. And if you don't agree with me on this, please don't be mad at me. I just don't agree with this. I don't believe in an evil race of anything. That's my belief. I believe it's wrong to say that this race or that race is evil or inferior or whatever because I just I believe that's totally against every scripture I've ever read. Further, I don't believe that angels can have intimate relations and I don't believe they can reproduce. So what about this term in Genesis 6, sons of God? And I believe that in scripture we find four terms, uh, four different ways that sons of God can be interpreted. The first type is indeed angels. When we read Job 38, 5-7, it talks about the sons of God. That's angels, obviously. But I think there's a second type of sons of God, and that's someone who has the Holy Spirit. We can find this in Romans 8, 14. I think there's a third type of sons of God, and this is figurative, and it uh, refers to mankind in general. We can find that in Malachi 2, 10. And I think we can also find that in Luke 3, 38. And I believe this fourth type of sons of God means the descendants of Seth. And I think that's what we have in Genesis 6-2. I believe that the sons of God in Genesis 6 refers to Seth's descendants. And I don't believe that Genesis 6 has anything to do with angels marrying women. Genesis 6 is talking about Seth, Seth's descendants uh, uh, in mankind in general. It's, like, it's hard to say. It's like she sells seashells by the seashores. It's kind of hard to come out. Okay. And what does is, what is all this that we're getting into about angels have to do with God's law? Well, to me, brethren, it's simple. Mankind has been rejecting God's law since the very beginning. Someone says, well, you know, we hear the argument, God's law didn't exist until the time of Moses. No, we saw in the white handout. It shows that God's law existed long before Moses. It also continued long after the, the crucifixion. God's law did not begin with Moses. It did not end with Jesus dying on the stake. 
God's law has always existed and it has always been rejected by the majority of mankind. When atheists and agnostic want you to believe that mankind today ascended from cavemen, they don't want to admit that cavemen have always existed. They existed from the beginning, they never stopped existing, and they exist today. Even now, you can go find tribes of people near the equator where they live in caves and trees. They run around naked, they have no written language, they have no musical instruments, they only have the most rudimentary knowledge of tools, they are totally primitive. Are we to believe that someday, without the help of the civilized world, there will become an advanced race of people who will be descended from these people who were running around in the Amazon forest? That's not likely. Then why do we believe that you and I descended from cavemen, from people just like this? The story of mankind is that we were created perfect. We had advanced knowledge from the beginning. But the more men rejected God's law, the more degenerate they became. Today's cavemen that we see on the earth today are descended from the same ancestors that you and I have. The ancestors who lived at the time of Adam. Ancestors who knew from the beginning about metallurgy. Who knew about stringed musical instruments. Who knew about wind musical instruments. They knew how to read and write. They knew how to build buildings. They knew how to build cities. We find mankind doing all these things all the way back to Genesis 4. And, it, and, there, and it's hard to go any further back than Genesis 4. You can go some ways back, but not further. Not a whole lot further. Further indications of how mankind has degenerated is when we look at the laws of marrying. Today it's against the law for first cousins to marry in almost 50 states. Some states still allow it, most don't. And these are good restrictions because we know that the offspring of incestuous unions can create children with genetic defects. Some states from time to time even consider banning marriage between second cousins. When the Hebrews came out of Egypt, they had no restrictions against first cousins marrying. Now they had restrictions. For example, they were not allowed to marry close relatives such as sisters, brothers, aunts, and uncles. And apparently the world's gene pool back then was stronger than it is now because they didn't have to worry about genetic problems when first cousins married. But it appears as though even though the gene pool was stronger during the time of Moses than it is now, it was even stronger during the time of Abraham. Remember that Abraham's first wife, and how many wives did he have? Three, his first one was Sarah. The second one was, um, um, help me out here. Huh? Keturah was his third wife. His second wife was Hagar. How could I forget Hagar? Yeah. Uh, but his first wife, Sarah, was actually his half-sister according to Genesis 20.12. Apparently marrying a half-sister in Abraham's time was not a genetic problem because the gene pool was so much stronger back then. Now let's go back even further in history. We find that Cain married a woman. We don't know where she came from. We don't know her name. I don't know who her parents were. We can only guess. But if we believe that Adam and Eve were the only created beings, then this wife of Cain had to be a descendant from Adam and Eve. In all probability, Cain probably married one of his sisters, maybe even a niece. And if we can believe Josephus, Adam and Eve had 33 sons and 23 daughters. And considering how long people lived back then, this many kids and a couple makes a lot of sense. It doesn't seem like it would work now, but it could if you lived to be over 900 years. If Cain indeed married his sister, it would be a strong indication that the gene pool right after creation was very, very strong. Very, very strong. Mankind has not yet degenerated to the point where they had, at, at that time, where they had to worry about producing offspring from what we would now call an incestuous relationship. Again, mankind has not ascended over time. Mankind has gotten weaker over time. In a sermon I heard a few years ago, it was stated, every human being lives within a culture, but not every human being lives within a civilization. Cavemen live in a culture. This applies to cavemen who lived thousands of years ago, hundreds of years ago, even the ones that are living now today. But these cavemen do not have a civilization 
which man had from the very beginning when he was still obeying and observing God's law. So, we know that giants did exist. These giants were healthy, they were strong, they were robust. The giants were intelligent with much larger brains than we had. These giants had long, long lifespans. Now, brethren, we live in exciting times. If we had lived 100 or 200 years ago, we would have had to take Genesis 6 on faith. And this was before the research of guys like von Kenningswald and Wiedenreich. But today we have so much new archaeological proof to back up what God gives us in the Scriptures. The archaeologist Spade constantly discovers proof of God's Word. And finally, we must grudgingly acknowledge the following. Mankind has always, continually, and repeatedly rejected God's law. Always. And the degeneracy of the human race that we find moving forward through history is a direct result of of that rejection. Moses best summed it up when he told the Israelites of the importance of obeying God's law. In Leviticus and Deuteronomy, Moses lists, makes this list about how breaking God's law teaches nothing but, it's going to give you nothing but sickness and strife and death. And conversely, Moses says, keeping the law is going to give you happiness, health, and longevity. And he closed with his ringing admonition in Deuteronomy 30, 30 verse 19 where he says, I call on heaven and earth to record this day against you that I've set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that you and your descendants may live. But the Israelites were like the rest of mankind. They continually rejected God's law over and over and over. What happens to a man when he rejects God's law? He becomes capable of killing his own brother, as we saw happen at the very beginning with Cain and Abel. What happens to a man when he rejects God's law? He becomes capable of joining with other people in rebellion against God so that he can participate in governments that enslave people, as we saw at the Tower of Babel. What happens when a man rejects God's law? He becomes capable of drunken debauchery that we see at Sinai at the very time that God is preparing to give his people the Decalogue. What happens to a man when he rejects God's law? He becomes capable of human sacrifice where in times past he thinks nothing of burning his child at the altar of Molech and at the present time thinks nothing of killing millions of unborn children every year in the name of abortion on demand. And the, the abortion that goes on in this country, brethren, is abominable. What happens to a man when he rejects God's law? He rejects the beautiful truths that we find in the Old Testament regarding the Sabbath and the Holy Days. A rejection that we see done by the apostate church, which began during the lifetimes of the writers of the New Testament. What happens to a man when he rejects God's law? He becomes susceptible to diseases like the plague that we saw in Europe during the Dark Ages, where the churches of this world taught against taking a bath because it sounded too Jewish where smelling badly was considered a spiritual blessing. I'm not making this up. Where the Jews were killed because they followed Old Testament practices of disposing of human waste and dead animals. What happens when a man who rejects God, to a man when he rejects God's law? He looks for a way to live a life of demented pleasure, rejecting responsibility of taking care of his wife and his kids. How many people do you know that are living in poverty because the dad is hooked on drugs or alcohol? And I personally know of families who live in filthy shacks up in the woods of southeastern Oklahoma where the dad is spending all his time not trying to get caught as he spends his day working on his meth lab or tending his pot garden. These people live like cavemen. A lot of times they don't even have running water or electricity up there because the dad is so messed up on meth and alcohol. What happens to a man when he rejects God's law? In short, he continues the downward slide of humanity as his mind gets more and more in tune with Satan the devil. Brethren, we have been blessed with so much truth regarding God's precious law. And we have been given the responsibility to teach Jesus. And with that responsibility comes teaching the whole truth of Jesus. That he was not born on December 25th. That he was not resurrected on a Sunday. That he did not do away with the laws of clean and unclean. That he did not come to replace God's high days with pagan holidays. That he did not come to do away with God's law. 
We have the responsibility to teach God's law, and it's a wonderful blessing that we have. God's law helps us to better commune with our Creator. It helps us in our everyday lives. And praise God that He has given us this very glorious truth. This is the Jesus that we should be preaching with all our hearts and our souls. Is God, God's church, <clears throat> excuse me, is God's church going to stop mankind's rejection of God's law? Are we going to stop it? Nope. Is God's church going to stop mankind's degeneration that's been going on for 6,000 years? Nope. Is my joining the Republican or Democrat Party or the Libertarian Party or getting involved in some secessionist movement, is that going to make people act better? No. I can't make people change. I'm powerless in this regard. Only the return of Jesus will fix all this and will put a stop to this degeneracy once and for all. And praise God that that day will come, and I pray that it will come in our lifetime. I mean, who wants to be resurrected if you can be twinkled? Wouldn't you rather be? You know, I, I want to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. I don't, our job, brethren, is not try, to try to regulate the actions of people in an attempt to stop the downward slide of humanity. This downward spiral is not going to stop until the end of the age. It's not going to slow down. In fact, it's probably just going to get worse. Instead, our job is to teach the kingdom of God and convert sinners to Christ. That's what we do. In that kingdom, mankind will finally be able to be at one with God. No more uh, sliding into this degeneracy. No longer substituting pagan lies for biblical truths and no longer rejecting God's law. So brethren, let's always keep our eye on the prize. Let's, her, let's work hard to preach the Jesus, the true Jesus of the Bible. Let's always pray, Thy kingdom come. And when we praise God with song, let's sing words, wonderful words such as, Oh, how love I thy law, it is ever with me. Thy commands make me wiser than my unfriendly foes. Oh, how sweet are thy words more than honey is sweet. I have more understanding because I dwell on thy law.